Another roller coaster session that we saw early buying lift all the major indices off the canvas and then a self inflicted wound by the administration. I'm not talking about President Trump's criticism or displeasure with Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve, which, by the way, I think is legitimate, even a brilliant political move that we'll discuss later in the show. The Dow climb, uh, it erased those 100 points. It was building momentum. And then Larry Kudlow contradicted a report of a possible meeting between President Trump and China's President Xi. Well, with so much uncertainty swirling in the air, it was a really ill-timed moment for such confusion. The rally effort lost traction, and the Dow, well, now it's down almost 1,400 points in the last two sessions. Now, the session was interesting because finally we had all the hallmarks of panic, wiping away the veneer of calm. That, I think that was actually a good thing. Massive rotation out of the spiders, 400% volume increase there. We saw some funds going to gold up 3% and some go back into bonds. Right now, history tells us to be looking for opportunities. Now, that said, I hear your frustration when the experts say buy the dip every day. We know you only have so much money and right now probably even less nerve. I get that. Here's the trick. Don't focus on picking the bottom. The investors that get in a little bit early, I think, will be those that make the big money, while those who are waiting for the bottom will miss the bottom and they'll continue to wait. In fact, millions of would-be investors are still waiting for the retest of that March 2009 low. At this point, look for the names that you know have great fundamentals and watch the tape. Let the market help you narrow your selection. Here to help us break it all down, Jeffrey Cleveland, Peyton and Regal's chief economist, stock swoosh, Melissa Armo, and David Nelson, Bell Point Asset Management's chief strategist. David, what did you make A of the session? Uh, late, it felt like, okay, we had capitulation off almost 700 points, and then we were down less than 300 points, and then again, we just drifted into the low. I think we all kind of expected it to continue, because coming into the session, the VIX just wasn't there. When this all started, the VIX was down around 12, a lot of complacency. Got the VIX is the fear index. Fear index. And, and, you know, if you look back over the last five years, these bottoms tend to happen with the VIX somewhere north of four, 50, 25. And the good news is that we hit that today. And, and I would say that right now, you're probably within one to two trading sessions of at least a tradable rally. Melissa? Well, like I said last night, if everybody watched the show, the banks report tomorrow morning, so the market could recover tomorrow. But after a sell-off like yesterday, wasn't surprised we gapped down this morning where we're down big last night. We tried to rally today. We tried to hold on. We couldn't do it. We dropped. So tomorrow morning, if the banks don't perform, I think it's going to be very problematic. And really what I'm concerned about with the sell-off, even though I'm bullish on the market in the long term, even into the end of the year, even into 2019, even into 2020, I'm concerned that we're not, that we opened the year at the Dow at 24 4,800 around, and so now we're about 25,000 in the close today, and that isn't that good as far as looking at the whole year, and we're in October. That's the only thing, and I'm like, uh, you know what I mean? As an economist, uh, what should we be concerned about? Is the market telling us something about the economy that perhaps two weeks ago we hadn't thought about? Charles, whenever you have big moves like this in markets, as an economist, you sit back and think, what's changed? Has something changed in the fundamental story? And the answer is no. And in fact, the data that we've seen in the last seven to 10 days has been even better. We've got an unemployment rate lower than it's been since the 1960s. So I don't think the fundamental story has changed. What's changed is we've had a nice run up in stocks. Well, we've and had a couple a of uh, companies this week, industrial names and material names that have warned uh, and those stocks took it on the chin pretty good so and they're talking about higher costs they're talking about currencies particularly emerging market the currencies being weak uh, we see weakness among the Chinese consumer hurting some of our, our, our luxury goods makers so does that work into your equation at all I think globally you do have a little bit of weakness in the data we look at global purchasing manager indexes and you see that China in particular is teetering right on the 50 threshold so right on the brink of expansion or contraction the world though as a whole is still growing, I think, this year at about 4%, which would be a decent rate of growth. So I, I'm not too worried. And the thing that jumped out to me today, actually, Charles, was Netflix. I think Netflix was off 8%. Are you telling me something in the last couple of days changed with the U.S. consumer such that Netflix was due for I, a I got to take the other side of that, Charles, because I look overseas. When I see credit default swaps blow out and even sovereign debt like a developed nations like Italy. That tells me something's wrong out there. If is Italy, Italy a developed there, nation? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm only being halfway facetious here, but go ahead. Well, <laughs> look, uh, emerging markets are problematic because in the end, these are our customers. And if they're hurting, and likely because of the Fed, uh, right now, which exacerbates that problem. In the end, 40% of S&P 500 revenue is international. So we need these. We need these economies doing better than they are right now. That's a big problem for the market right now. I think. Over
overall, though, remember, if you bought right around that 2009, beginning of the Dow was around 10,000, you are up more than 100% return on investment. What if you didn't, though, and profits. you've been waiting? Uh, you know, because, uh, again, I started out explaining how a lot of people told me they were going to buy as soon as we retested that low. Of course, it never happened. And believe it or not, millions of people missed the subsequent rally. The question now is, when is the opportunity for them? Because you seem to think this is going to be short-lived if you think we're going to rally into the end of the I year. I think, again, I'm positive because we're going into earnings season. I would have a different outlook if it was the end of and the you're year. you're not concerned about some of the warnings that we've already seen? Warnings meaning what? Earnings about warnings. Tariffs or, no, no, no. Oh, just earnings no, warnings. They don't know Currency. what they're going to report. No. That, no? No. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Well, just we like know. We they, know. They, you know, the CEO of a company tells us that something's wrong. We, we've got to suspect yeah, something. Yeah, but again, things, some, something's things wrong. surprise you. The banks gapped up, and then they fell and sold off. So well, they report tomorrow. You. They report tomorrow morning, and we'll see. We'll see how that pans out. But you know, right now. The earnings season, when a company reports, there's a report card also of how good or bad the analysts were in predicting the number. And right now, expectations are pretty high. My, my fear is that we're going to fade that as, we, as, as these companies I'm report. actually excited that they're high. I want these expectations to be high. Why? why? Not, yeah, why? Because why? I want us to eclipse high expectations. I want the bar to be very high. I if want you're correct, to then, we, then we go much higher. And, of course, the key is going to be guidance. As we go into next year, the, compar the co comparisons to this year are going to be extraordinarily difficult. Let's talk about those banks for a moment. Uh, they have to come through. Three big banks, uh, Wells Fargo, PNC, J.P. Morgan. I think all eyes on J.P. Morgan. Now, we know they're going to make a lot of money trading, particularly this kind of volatility. What do they have to say about the economy, though, from, an, uh, from your point of view? I think what they have to say is it's right out in front of us. We're seeing 4% GDP growth here in the third quarter. We're at 112 months in this expansion, Charles. It's going to be the longest expansion on record. So we're going to eclipse the 120-month record of the 1990s. This expansion is going to carry on. And I think in a year's time, investors will look back on this, this period of, as volatility. But equities eventually end up going higher because equities go higher as long as as the cycle continues. The big question for investors is, are we on the cusp of a more serious downturn? As my friend says, there are some signs of weakness globally, but I don't think that, that that's a risk to my view, point, I don't think is, it spills over. This, this contraction that we've just seen right now is pretty normal right now. And the one thing that I look at, I put an S&P 500 chart, and you look at 12-month forward earnings, that's still pointed north at this point. And it's, in the end, in the long run, stocks follow earnings. So. Right now, you have to. You have I to started hang in. putting a list together today of the names that were intriguing. I was at 11 before I had to bolt out of the income day of this show. A lot of stocks in this carnage are looking pretty good, like they're finding bottoms already. What do you use as a buy signal, Melissa, as a technician? Strength in the pre market and post market. So that's what I want to see. I want to see JP Morgan. I want to see these stocks gap up. And unlike previous earnings earlier this year, they could rally because mm -hmm. we've had such big sell offs. In other words, just think of the common sense. It, all these stocks sold off in the last week. So all the sellers are really out mm -hmm. and the shorts are up. So on good earnings, and just think of this, common sense, on good earnings, you're going to get people are wanting and waiting on the sidelines to buy in. So any excuse, any reason, even though, remember we talked about the data this out tomorrow morning, it's not a big deal. But if it's good, any excuse, any tweet from Trump, anything at all, people are ready to pounce. And that's what you want to look at. You want Possibly to look at the Possibly up five or 600 points tomorrow? Possibly. No, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that at all. I want to see it. I want to see where we are tomorrow morning, like at 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 5 a.m., when these banks are Possible report. if we get good numbers from J.P. Morgan, we could be up 500 points tomorrow? That's a tough number, but if you've got a real <laughs> blowout number, you could, you could certainly see a strong rally. Okay, I'm, I'm going go to say four or 500 is possible if right. we get the right combination. I, I'm hoping a anything's right. possible, Charles. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jeff, you can come back anytime. <laughs> All right, folks. Now, uh, we got some uh, crucial changes in our Fox Business Show lineup that we've got to share with you. First off, starting on Monday, this show will be moving to 2 p.m. Eastern uh, after all the show's name, Making Money. And we want to be there with you during the markets to help you with these volatile moves. Uh, so we're moving out of the 6 p.m. spot. In its place will be the evening edit. Elizabeth McDonald will be moving her show to this hour. That starts on Monday as well. So obviously you want to keep it right here on Fox Business. Now coming up, the president pointing a finger or several fingers, if you will, at the Fed for this market's fall. Is the Federal Reserve and Jay Powell, are they loco? We'll debate it next. <laughs>